clearly the populist mood is back. Clearly the populist moment is back. Generally speaking, if you pan out and you look at 24, you look at France, you look at the rest of Europe, you look at where Britain is, you look at where the polling is in America. The, the big message for me is nearly 10 years on from 2016, these populist movements are as strong, if not stronger, than they were nearly a decade ago. And millions of voters are saying to the elites, once again, listen, you either address my concerns or I'm going to keep sending these guys into office and I'm going to keep sending these guys into political power. Hello and welcome. In today's video, we'll listen to British professor, author and commentator Matt Goodwin in order to understand the great divide between elites and the people. Let's check it out. Essentially, what I'm talking about here is, is a new ruling class in Western societies that has fundamentally lost touch with millions of voters within their societies who are having to pay the costs of the decisions that they're making, like mass immigration, uh, hyper-globalization, the advance of woke ideology or radical progressivism. And this new elite class are defined by many things, but mainly it's their university education from elite institutions, uh, which they really value. They define themselves by their achieved identity, uh, by their educational credentials. They tend to live in the big cities, the university towns. They tend to have parents who also belong to the uh, university class. Uh, they tend to be financially secure, if not very affluent, which gives them insulation from the consequences of the policies they're advocating. Uh, and they are highly socially liberal, or as uh, the philosopher John Gray would call them, hyper-liberal, uh, or radically woke progressive. They, they, they now define themselves really by their luxury beliefs, by their ideology that is imbued with social liberalism, gender identity, an anti-Western, anti-nation sentiment, and what's interesting about this new elite, unlike the old elite, you know, the old elite still exist. You know, I'm in the UK, you see them in the clubs of Pall Mall and Mayfair all the time, the kind of old Tory elite. What's interesting about the new elite is they don't derive their sense of status from wealth. Yes, they have money and they're secure, but that's not really the main um, source of their social status. They derive their status and their esteem and their sense of honor and moral righteousness from their ideology, from their social liberalism or from their, their radical progressivism. And um, increasingly, you know, this isn't just about a left-right issue. Increasingly, this, this new ruling class is visible on both the left and the right. Um, in the UK, for example, they represent about 20% of the population who hold strongly and consistently uh, radically liberal values. You know, they, they want more immigration. They're comfortable with weak borders. Um, they are very um, skeptical of national identity, which they want to be repackaged around diversity and multiculturalism. So they have a very different outlook. And what I'm arguing in this book is if you want to explain why Donald Trump is still competitive in America, why national conservative movements, Finland and elsewhere, are doing very well, why Britain voted for Brexit, you know, why Italy, Italy swung behind Georgia Maloney, why Germany is now moving in the same direction. You have to begin by looking at this ruling class and how they have lost touch with millions of voters on um, issues. More recently, people like Rob Henderson, Cambridge, former Cambridge academic, who has talked about luxury beliefs. It's a very interesting idea. Rob argues that what the elite class today does is it it really advocates policies that bring members of the elite class no costs, but which impose enormous costs on everybody else. Mm. So the, the main example of that would be mass immigration. Mass immigration does not damage the elite class, the minority elite class, because it benefits them in many ways, you know, in terms of cleaners, in terms of servicing the economy that works for, for the winners, if you like, the winners of globalization. Um, and also their experiences of immigration tend to be fundamentally different from working class people. You know, when I talk to my academic colleagues about immigration, they think it's mainly PhD students from, you know, California, you know, whereas for the working class, immigration is 
is very, very different. Mm. It's low wage, it's low skill migration that's displacing them in Western economies. Now, what I'm arguing in this book is, if you, take, if you step back and you look at Western democracies over the last 30 years, what has happened is that yes, economic issues are still very important, but politics has become two-dimensional in that cultural issues now matter as much as economic issues. Cultural issues around migration, borders, security, nationhood, um, you know, our, how we think about our history, how we think about our identity, biological reality versus self-constructed uh, gender identities. And it's on those cultural issues that the new elite has basically lost touch with millions of voters in their own country. And they've radicalized over the last 15 years or what the Americans would call the great awakening of the elite class. You know, Andrew Sullivan, who's a writer that I have also been influenced by in America, uh, he's made this point that we are living through the greatest radicalization of the elite class since the 1960s. And what does he mean by that? He means, well, particularly since 2010, as we've gone through things like Brexit, Trump, the rise of populist parties in Europe, what's happened is the new elite have moved even further to the cultural left in response to those mm. rebellions. And they've double down. They said, no, we want more immigration. We're not going to compromise. We want to defund the police. We want to tell people that little boys can become little girls and little girls can become little boys. Or we want to denigrate our history. In fact, we want to wipe the slate clean. We're ashamed of our history. You should feel a sense of guilt when you think about Western history. This culture of repudiation, which is what Roger Scruton called it. It's a culture of repudiation, repudiating our past, oikophobia, hating your own people. And um, I think that is where you've seen the ruling class move sharply to the left. And the average voter has been where they've always been, you know, leaning a little bit in a more populist direction on the economy, thinking big business is exploiting them, globalization isn't really working, but leaning quite right on culture, saying actually, I'm okay with some immigration, but I want much less. Yeah. Um, I don't want it to come at the cost of my national community and my identity. And so the elite class has drifted off to the left. The average voter has kind of stayed where they are, looking at, at politicians in both mainstream legacy conservative parties and also center-left parties and green parties and saying, well, what the hell is happening to you? What, why have you become so radical? Because you no longer represent my values. And you certainly don't give me a voice in the institutions. You certainly don't make me feel as though I'm a respected member of this community. And that fundamentally is what has been going on in Western democracies. And what I'm trying to say in this book is, look, the elite class can either make a compromise with those voters and accept that they don't want to live in this elite project, or they can keep doubling down on their beliefs and watch these populist rebellions grow and grow and grow and become stronger, which is actually what's happening mm. from France to Germany to America to the UK now with Nigel Farage and a new party. You know, populism is not going anywhere. It's just getting stronger and stronger. If you like what you're seeing, please consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel. A few clicks can make all the difference to us and help the channel grow. Thank you. I think it's very significant. Only a few years ago, every academic under the sun was telling us that we were going to have a green surge in European politics, largely because most academics support the Greens or radical left movements. So they were very supportive of what was happening. It was quite obvious that this was going to end in an election disaster because the policies that many Green parties have been bringing forward are not realistically anchored in the life experiences of ordinary voters. Net zero is a great example of that. When you're basically asking people to pay more for energy, uh, for driving their cars around London with the ULEZ charges, when you're imposing net zero type taxation uh, and fiscal costs on people because of a policy that is much more strongly celebrated among the elite class, there are going to be political consequences. And we're now seeing those consequences across much of Europe. Working people have been hit on multiple fronts, inflation from COVID, the furlough, the lockdowns, uh, you know, the cost of living has gone through the roof at the same time as the elites have imposed this net zero project on everybody else top down. There's a great example of this uh, here in the UK. We had a local council that was investing millions of pounds in expanding net zero. So it actually wanted to go net zero 10 years before the rest of the country. Uh, and at the same time, 
as local council left-wing elites were pushing these uh, policies, the local library was closed down. Core public services couldn't be delivered. Uh, old people weren't getting meals on wheels, you know, which is where they get, they get food taken to their house. It's a great example of the luxury belief class advocating policies that bring them benefits, that make them feel good, that give them a sense of moral righteousness, but which antagonize everybody else who actually has to live with the consequences of those decisions. And this is where I think we are with a lot of the green movements in Europe. You know, don't forget too, politically, their support is concentrated in the big cities, university towns. So unlike the national populace, it is harder often for green parties to build a very big, durable, wide coalition of support of the kind that we've seen in places like Eastern Germany, or places like we've seen in you know, the east coast of England or the, the industrial heartlands in France. It's, it's more difficult for green parties to sustain themselves over the longer term. But of course, energy is part of it. But you know, at the core of all of these parties is the immigration population nexus. That is what ultimately this is all about. The more immigration, the better these parties will do. That is basically the, the, the bottom line of what's going on here. This divide is becoming more apparent by the day, with huge ramifications in today's politics. This is a very good description of the feeling of many voters, which then leads to certain voting choices. There's clearly a gap in society. And the definition of luxury beliefs is particularly well stated. These beliefs are not producing any good results. On the contrary, luxury beliefs lead to disaster politics, which, in turn, leads to the growing resentment amongst millions of people who already feel angry and abandoned in the first place. This divide is one of the reasons behind the current political scenario, the rise of new parties, populism, and ultimately, the political realignment we're witnessing today. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.